Gu Kuang in the palace. From the tall jade tower rises the song of a flute. Carried on the wind, the palace lady's happy chatter. In moon hall, shadows lengthen, a water clock drips. Crystal blinds raised to watch the autumn river. So we continue with the uh, heptaslavic quatrains, and just like the one we read yesterday, this is the only poem in the anthology by this poet, Gu Kuang. And like Liu Zhongzhong, I think he was a relatively well-known mm, early mid Tang poet. As usual, when we introduce a poet, uh, we can introduce a little bit of his background. In fact, I had heard of Gu Kuang, hadn't heard of Liu Zhongzhong. So Gu Kuang was born around 727 in Suzhou. Uh, he passed the Jinxi examination in 757 and served for a time in the Salt Monopoly Bureau. From 771 to 74, he traveled in Huzhou, exchanging poems with the monks Zhao Ran and others, just like Liu Zhongzhong had. Later, while traveling, he met other people like Liu Hun and Li Bi, who became his patrons. In 780, he was appointed administrative assistant to the regional military commissioner at San Juan. And in the 780s, he attained, well, not he, his patron, Liu Hun, attained a high office in the capital and uh, managed to land him an appointment as well as a rectifier in the Court of Judicial Review. In 787, with Li Bi's help, he was appointed editor, 788 assistant editorial director in the palace library. But after his patrons died in about 789, uh, he was demoted after having been accused of satirizing the dominant court faction. And uh, he was basically sent to revenue manager of Raozhou, a minor position. 793, he would retire and uh, move on to live in the Taoist center at Mao Shang. And uh, he spent the last years of his life, which was, you know, he, he lived well into his 80s while just traveling around central China and making it until the 9th century. So, uh, that's for his biography. Now, let's go into the poem. Now, the title of the poem is pretty, pretty clear, In the Palace. So, what we are being shown here are a couple of, of glimpses of palace life, which is a topic that appears a lot in, in the poetry, generally focused, as we've seen in the palace-style poetry, through the, 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 the languishing bell, the beautiful concubine, or or secondary imperial wife who languishes in luxurious apartments away from her beloved, from the ruler. Although it doesn't seem so explicitly, some interpretations of the poem that we've read interpret this poem in such a way. So this is would be, in, in that case, a poem mm, describing the lament of an abandoned uh, palace woman, or an abandoned palace wife or concubine of the emperor. In this case, the first couplet... Well, the whole poem would be seen, would be the perceptions, especially the oral impressions of this woman. And in the first couplet, we have the, uh, the, the, this woman listening to joy and singing and pleasure of other imperial concubines who do share the emperor's favor and who are happy, contrasted in the second couplet with her loneliness and her sadness and the melancholy sadness that envelops her. So, yeah, I think this interpretation pretty much makes sense. Uh, the first time I read it without checking those notes, it just felt like a series of juxtaposed and rather independent impressions from the palace and from the female quarters of the palace. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet and clarify a few of its aspects. So, first couplet. From the tall jade tower rises the song of a flute. Carried on the wind... The palace lady's happy chatter. So the poem starts with two oral impressions which convey joy, entertainment, happiness, the pleasures of palace life. It, there's also a, a sense of movement in, in, in the poem because those songs, those sounds of the flute or of laughing are being carried up and horizontally away from the place where they generate. So the poem starts with this tall jade tower. I'm, I'm not sure this is a specific building in the Imperial Palace, but, you know, jade tower would have been a common name for any, any, any building in the Imperial Palace. So there's one tower among the many called the jade tower. It's high. Uh, elevation, highness is generally associated with Imperial constructions and with 
with many tropes of the of the emperor, you know, as a panoptic figure that can see from high but is not seen. So uh, from that tall jade tower, which may be seen from other parts of the imperial palace, rises the song of a flute. So somebody is playing music inside that tower. Probably there is some partying going on. Maybe with the emperor or maybe just the concubines having fun. The second line develops. It continues with this image of the song, the sound coming from the jade tower and their sounds of happiness. Carried on the wind, the palace ladies' happy chatter. So some palace ladies or one palace lady, probably more than one of its chatter, I imagine they're talking with each other. Well, just like the sound of the flute is carried by the wind, the sound of their happy conversation is carried away. So it's a, a scene of happiness taking place in this jade tower. Second couplet. In moon hall, shadows lengthen, a water clock drips. Crystal blinds raised to watch the autumn river. Now, there is another figure who is not in the jade tower, who is in the moon hall. And we may imagine that the person in the moon hall is the protagonist and actually is the focalizer for the poem. It is probably this woman in the moon hall who is listening to those sounds coming from the tall jade tower, but who is not there. Now the moon always denotes, uh, almost always denotes in Chinese poetry, sadness, melancholy, bittersweetness, loneliness. So this moon hall is properly named because the woman, like the moon, is, you know, languishing, waning. Uh, autumn moon is a lot of times used as a symbol for or an autumn fan which is round and white like the moon, is generally used uh, as a symbol for the abandoned concubine. But anyway, in this moon hall, the shadows lengthen. The shadows lengthen, I imagine, because the, the I actually don't know why. It's night, so perhaps the faces of the, the moon moving in the sky is setting down after a long time and the shadows created by the moon are longer. Perhaps the candles or the illumination is burning out and that generates longer shadows than before. But anyway, in this moon hall, we have these shadows becoming longer, increasing darkness, and we have a water clock dripping. Clepsidras were typical in the imperial palace. They were the main clocks used uh, along with certain candles. But there is a contrast here, implicit contrast, between the rowdiness of the flute and the, the singing voices and probably the quietness of this moon hall where the where the focalizer of the poem and an imperial concubine is probably alone. The shadows are lengthening, she's in the dark, she's probably alone. The only sound that is heard in this moon hall is the clepsidra drops, tick, 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 falling down. So, a contrastive image with that of the first couplet, which also denotes unhappiness and loneliness. And what, this, what does this woman do besides uh, listening in silence and in the dark? Well, crystal blinds raised to watch the autumn river. So she hears those sounds, she is in silence, and she is doing something as well with her eyes. So she's raising the crystal blinds. We already found these crystal blinds referred to in a previous poem. Probably they refer to decorated blinds in the imperial palace. So she, well, those blinds are raised, or she has raised them, because she wants to look out. She wants to look at the Autumn River. Now, the Autumn River here denotes the Milky Way. Uh, the, it's called sometimes the River of Heaven or the Autumn River because it's believed that in autumn the Milky Way is particularly shiny and visible. Now, again, this watching the Autumn River is not just uh, an, an accidental hobby that the um, focalizer of the poem is um, enjoying. Uh, first, remember, it's autumn, so the melancholy season, Described as a river, and rivers generally metaphors for the passage of time, the inexorable passage of time. But then there's also uh, an implicit legend, which I think might be being referenced here. So uh, in autumn, seventh day, seventh month, there was a traditional Chinese festival, also imported into classical Japan. There, were, there it's called Tanabata. And the, the festival commemorates the meeting of two lovers, uh, who are two stars, uh, the, the weaving maid, and, uh, and uh, the, the herder. 
And these two stars in the legends, they were lovers who were spending all their time together until the gods decided to punish them and separate them um, through the Milky Way. And only in Tanabata, on the seventh day of the seventh month, can they get together and enjoy one night together. So uh, this festival and this legend became, you know, a very common topic, a very common trope of separation of lovers with many poems on the topic. And I think it's implicitly referred to here. By contrast, the, 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 the poetic persona of the woman is not able to enjoy even in this night when the two who are separated all the year are united. She suffers in loneliness. So another melancholy tone and another take on the abandoned beauty in Tang poetry. <laughs> 